Chapter 21 A Visitor from the East Almost as quickly as Penny became aware of the face, it vanished. Of one detail only could be she be certain. The person who had looked through the window was a man. A cold chill passed over the girl. The man at the window had been staring, not at herself, but at Jerry, who lay on the bed. Penny ran to the cabin door. No one was in sight. After a moment's hesitation, she went out into the cold night air, quickly walking around the building. The yard was deserted, and the only sound came from the river where a bullfrog gave a deep-throated clug. Penny glanced sharply about, thinking that the dense bush overhanging the river bank would offer a hiding place for a prowler. Had there been the slightest doubt in her mind that she had seen a face at the window, it was displaced when she found large footprints embedded in the soft earth around the outside of the bedroom wall. Someone connected with those mysterious disappearances at the old mansion may have seen Joe drag Jerry out of the water, she thought. We probably were followed here. More than ever, Penny became convinced that the reporter held the key to the situation, but a key which might never be capable of using. And if Jerry had the power to expose the person who had harmed him, those same persons would try every possible means to prevent him from revealing his knowledge. With another uneasy glance towards the river, Penny retreated to the cottage. Calling Mudcat Joe, she told him of her suspicions that someone might be lurking down along the willows. I'll have a look around, he said, reaching for his lantern. Maybe twas only Silas Solcum you saw. He's a feller to go on a prowling around at night, taking care of his nets. Mudcat made the rounds, returning to report that he could find no one near the cottage. Penny said no more, taking her post by Jerry's bedside again, but she remained firm in her belief that the prowler had not been Silas Sulcum. Later, when Louise came back from White Falls, Penny related the incident. Is it safe for Jerry to remain here? Louise asked in alarm. No, replied Penny, but until the doctor says he may be moved, we can't do otherwise. At least Jerry should be well guarded. Yes, I mean to talk with Dad about it when he comes. Jerry must have gone through a dreadful experience, Louise murmured. What do you suppose happened to him? I wish I knew, Penny answered soberly. I'm wondering if we shall ever know. An hour later, Mr. Parker arrived at the cottage. The sight of Jerry's thin, drawn face caused him to retreat hastily from the bedroom. I'll get the fiends who did this, if it's the last act of my life, he muttered. He, has he tried to talk, Penny? I don't believe he realizes what he's saying, she answered. He keeps repeating the words houseboat. And he murmurs something I can't understand about flaming eyes. Penny and Louise both were so weary they felt ready to drop. It was a relief to have Mr. Parker assume full responsibility. He was disappointed that Jerry could not be removed at once to the hospital, but in his usual efficient way, quietly made the best of the situation. A nurse was installed in the cottage while Mudcat Joe was told to maintain a constant guard over the premise. Penny and Louise felt they could do more, no more for Jerry, so they rode back to Riverview, arriving only a few hours before dawn. In the morning, the events of the night seemed to have no reality, yet the ache and pain in Penny's body gave positive proof that she had undergone a most unpleasant physical experience. Breakfasting late, she had just finished her orange juice and toast when the doorbell rang. That may be someone with a message about Jerry, she declared to Mrs. Weems. I'll answer. Penny ran to the door, but as she opened it, she saw that the elderly, well-dressed lady who stood there was a stranger. 
Are you by chance Miss Penelope Parker? inquired the visitor with a cordial smile. Why, yes. Won't you come in? Thank you. The woman sat down on the Davenport, loosening her wraps. I am Mrs. Faraday, she introduced herself. You sent me a telegram, I believe. Why, yes, stammered Penny. Your information alarmed me exceedingly, Miss Parker. I had planned a trip back here for some time. So, when I received your message, I decided to start at once. However, I must confess I had no idea you were so young. Tell me, did you not exaggerate the situation at Old Mansion? Indeed, I didn't, Mrs. Faraday. If anything, I kept serious matters from you. Have you talked with the Comstocks or Gregory Kane? No, I came directly here from the railroad station, Miss Faraday replied. Then I should suggest that you go to the old mansion at once. Just what is wrong there, Miss Faraday inquired. You speak so seriously. I prefer to have Gregory Kane tell you everything. And who is he? A detective. Now, you do alarm me, said Mrs. Faraday. I had intended to go to White Falls today, Penny told her. If you wish, I'll take you to the old mansion. Miss Faraday quickly accepted the invitation, and with a half an hour, she and Penny were motoring towards White Falls. During the ride, the two became very well acquainted, and the girl ventured to t ask a question regarding Mrs. Faraday's property holdings in and near the river town. She was not surprised to learn that the shed formerly occupied by the riverman and his family never belonged to the Gus Comstock. Why, I'm ashamed of the man for turning a poor family from the place, declared Miss Faraday indignantly. Mr. Comstock has done other things, too, which I fear will never meet with your approval, said Penny. For example, he has been operating the mansion as a tourist house. Indeed, exclaimed Miss Faraday. Well, we shall see about this. Why, my valuable paintings might have been stolen. Penny smiled, for she had her own opinion on Mrs. Faraday's pictures. At Old Mansion, Gus Comstock and his wife were allowed the freedom of the premises, although Gregory Kane, or one of the men, watched them constantly. Such a situation was deeply resented by the couple. They accepted it solely because refusal would mean they would be turned over to the police. As Penny and Mrs. Faraday drove up to the house, the woman remarked that since her absence, the river had cut deeply into her rear yard. She was displeased by the run-down appearance of the mansion, mentioning that only the previous year she had sent the Comstock's money to have it painted. You did the right thing to send for me and to send that telegram, Miss Parker, she declared. I have been cheated outrageously. Her glance encom encompassed the Chinese laundry adjoining the mansion. Such an ugly structure. The town never should have allowed the builder to jam it close to my house. It completely ruins the property. It doesn't improve it, agreed Penny. However, I imagine you knew the building had been erected. No, it has been put up since I left White Falls. They entered the house and there Miss Faraday's indignation mounted to a fever pitch. She wandered from room to room, exclaiming at damage done to her antique furniture. Suddenly she paused before one of the paintings in the library. Roll up the window shade, please, she requested in a tense voice. Penny obeyed, and the bright sunlight flooded into the room. Made the painting look more jaded than ever, Miss Faraday moved a step nearer, running her hand over the canvas. Then she turned to Penny, her eyes flashing. This is only a crude copy of the original portrait, she demanded. I have been robbed. Do, 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 do.